Hello and welcome to lecture 3b. The title here says localized pixel editing, editing, and we'll talk about that, but it's not the only thing we're going to get to here. So just to cover everything, um, here's the intro, local versus global editing, destructive versus non-destructive editing. Some of this should be familiar to you already from previous lectures, uh, perspective and distortion corrections and lens corrections, and then some transformation tips that I'm going to give you as well. So this is gonna be a little short one. We'll cover a couple things really quick. It's mainly intended to get you started on some of these concepts so that you can dig in deeper in the book and in Photoshop and play around with it there and start to learn things. Feel free, any of these items that we discuss or that we don't obviously to look it up online too. There are tons of tutorials, videos, lessons available to you easily with just a simple Google search or YouTube search to find more information and tips about using these things. And the best, like I always say, the best way to do it is try it out too. Open up Photoshop and follow along. Okay, so um, we use occasionally these terms in Photoshop uh, in editing in general. It should be fairly intuitive what we mean when we say that, but globalized editing versus localized editing, pretty straightforward. Um, globalized is whatever is gonna affect the entire layer. Localized editing is anything that's gonna affect just some of the pixels on that layer. So some examples would be, let's say we're gonna make a hue saturation adjustment using an adjustment layer. That's great, it's going to affect all the pixels on the layer where that adjustment is targeting. Um, if we want it to be a localized edit, that's easy. All we have to do is apply or adjust the layer mask for that adjustment layer, paint out the areas that we don't want it to apply to and it becomes localized editing in a sense. More so, we're talking about destructive changing pixels. Not destructive in the sense that it's a bad thing. Sometimes you, just, you do that and that's the way it works. Like the clone tool, for example, or the healing brush or something like that. You're actually modifying pixels, but you're specifically doing that in a certain area and not across the entire layer, like a hue saturation or curves or levels or some other kind of adjustment. So that's all that means. Destructive versus non-destructive, we've talked about this before too. Um, the ideal workflow is to make sure that whatever you're doing isn't going to lock you in or commit you to sticking with that change. You can undo it. So if you can undo it in some way, then it's non-destructive. And typically that means undo it some other way than just going back into your history panel or hitting command or control Z. That's not really non-destructive necessarily. Um, if pixels are actually changed as a result, then it's a destructive edit. Is it, if it's permanent, then it is. If you do it and then you make uh, 27 other changes, you have to undo 27 times to get to it, then it's not destructive. I'm sorry, it is destructive if that's the case. Um, does it result in you having fewer layers than you started with? Then yeah, it's destructive. So there's just some examples in these screenshots here. Uh, if you go to image menu, and go to adjustments, all of those adjustments there are destructive adjustments. If you use an adjustment layer instead, then those are the exact same adjustments, but they're non-destructive because they're on their own layer and you can adjust them repeatedly over and over. You can modify them, change their opacity, all kinds of stuff. The eraser tool, for example, is another one that is a destructive tool. It erases the pixels which there are a few times where you will use the eraser tool. It's not like it's there for no reason. You, you'll use it occasionally, but um, use it for the right things. Make sure you're not using it when you should be using a non-destructive technique instead, like a layer mask. All right, so these two specifically, using adjustments and using the eraser tool are things that you wanna try to avoid as much as possible on assignments, because our assignments in this class are gonna be set up in a way that you won't need to be using those. Same thing if you're gonna make a selection around something and then hit the delete key to remove all those pixels, that would be the wrong way to do it. Instead, you'd want to make sure and just click on the layer mask button and use the layer mask instead of erasing those pixels. That's the good non-destructive way to do it. All right, so moving on to transformations now. Um, there are a lot of different transformations. Um, as you can see on the list on the left, there's a whole bunch. Puppet warp, scale, rotate, skew, distort, perspective warp. Um, some of them sound kind of familiar, like Puppet Warp and Warp. Mm, got Warp in the name, but they're not the exact same thing. Uh, perspective and Perspective Warp. Again, those have Perspective in the name, but they're still not quite the same thing too. So if you look at the menu, 
go to the edit menu, go down to where it says transform, and you'll see some of these are under the transform flyout. Some of them are not, they're just under the edit menu. Um, but there's a, there's a couple of differences. So just, uh, you'll want to play around with those. Some of them, the name makes sense, rotate, that kind of thing. Some of them you have to play with a little bit to figure out what it's talking about. I'm not going to walk through these and tell you what each of them do. I'd like you to open up a document. Ideally, a really easy way to do this is just make a square, for example, a simple square on a blank document, and then start using these transform tools on it, because then you can really easily see uh, where it's being distorted and things like that. Um, so play around with some of those things. They come in handy. Whenever we get into compositing, which is taking an image and merging it into a new one uh, with all kinds of different techniques, transformations are a big part of that. Being able to distort or warp or bend or rotate whatever that object is to make it fit in the new image, that's an important skill. So you're gonna be pretty familiar with these. The very last bullet point there, free transform, is probably the one that you'll use the very most because it will do a lot of the things that the other warps will do. So you don't have to go into um, perspective, for example, or skew uh, or rotate. You can just go to free transform. It'll do all those things. So I put some keyboard shortcuts on the right there. Uh, Control T or Command T. That is, uh, you use it all the time. That's going to let you transform your object. Now, before I get any further, well, we'll come back to this. Never mind. <laughs> I'm about to get sidetracked on smart objects there for a second, but we'll talk about that another time. So once you have used that keyboard shortcut to enter the free transform mode on your object, you'll see there are some handles. There's going to be a box around that with some control points or anchors on the, on the corners and in the middle. If you use some of the key modifier keys that are below this, then you'll see that you get some different options available to you. If you press and hold the control or command key while you put your cursor over those anchor points, watch your cursor and it'll change white. When it turns white, you can grab those anchor points and move them independently of each other. Otherwise, you're moving them kind of locked in. So again, I'm trying to describe this verbally, but it makes the most sense to do it. So just remember that these keyboard shortcuts are there. Um, control or command will break apart the proportions so that you can do some perspective warping. Shift is going to lock or constrain the proportions so that if you start out with a square and you're holding down shift, the only thing you're going to end up with is a bigger square or a smaller square. You're never going to get a uh, rectangle out of that if you're holding down shift, which most of the time when you're placing an object, unless you want to distort it, you're going to need to hold down shift. Um, that's one where people mess up a lot uh, frequently is placing something like a car or on a road or something like that. And they try to warp it to make it fit and they end up distorting it. So it's not the right shape anymore. That visually, we pick up on that very easily and you can tell that it's a, a Photoshop job if that's the case. And you don't want people to tell that what you did is Photoshop job. You want it to look normal, right? Okay. Alt or option. It's going to be kind of like what we discussed before with the, the uh, marquees, those marching ants. When you want to resize those or when you're creating those, Holding down Alt or Option is going to scale or, or uh, rotate or whatever your object from the center, not from the point that you're grabbing. If you hold down Shift and Alt or Option at the same time while you're grabbing and dragging on those anchor points, it's going to lock the aspect ratio and it's going to move it from the center. So that one you'll use all the time. Just remember Shift plus Alt or Option is super useful on all kinds of tools. So just be aware of that. All right. So we're going to talk about some more complex types of warping. And I've got a little GIF here on the screen, or GIF if you prefer, that demonstrates um, what perspective warp does. If you're familiar with photography at all, or if you just think back to when you've taken a picture of a building, for example, you'll notice that sometimes the top of the building will look smaller than the bottom where you're standing, especially if it's a large building and you're close to it. That is the perspective distortion that you get in most structures or lines or whatever. It's, it has to do with the vanishing points and things like that. So it's not a problem necessarily, but you do want to avoid that sometimes in your images because that distortion can be pretty um, distracting or unpleasant or undesirable. So there are ways to correct for that. Uh, some complex ways, if you have a few thousand dollars and want to buy some expensive camera gear, then you can go that route. But most of the time, we're not talking about photography in here. We're talking about how to fix other people's photography. So perspective warp is one of those things. 
it's pretty cool tool. It's fairly new, relatively new. It's not the oldest thing in Photoshop, I should say. But uh, you define the planes of whatever object or structure it is that you want to straighten out by drawing these grids on the different planes, different faces of that object, basically like a, a cube. And then once you've done that, you're going to manually, you can manually adjust those pins by dragging them out to fit. So I don't have the before and after on this screen, but you can imagine if I were to grab the top left and the top right pins and drag them both out a little bit, I could straighten out those exterior corners and get the building looking a lot straighter. So there are also some icons on the screen when you're in the perspective warp tool that you can click on and we'll give you some automatic adjustments that it will um, either straighten horizontal lines, straighten vertical lines, straighten all the lines. Uh, you can click and try those out too. Um, go online and find a picture of a building and give this a shot yourself. There's also probably, I think, some sample files with your textbook that might give you a good sample to try out of that too. I didn't check that yet. Okay. So when you're in the Perspective Warp tool, um, there are some additional keyboard shortcuts that you can use. I put those here. Um, as you're in Photoshop, you all have Photoshop open on your other screen, I'm sure, right now. So go ahead and pause this video, jump back into Photoshop, and try out some of the keyboard shortcuts too, as you can cycle through them and see some of the different things that you can do. All right, now that you're back to the video, <laughs> let's look at some other things. Um, Photoshop lets you do some things we like to call computational imaging. That's what I call them anyways, and many other people do. That is, uh, taking a photograph sometimes has certain limitations. For example, depth of field. You can see the image on the left, the back little doll, nesting doll is out of focus. It's blurry. Um, sometimes that's the thing that you want to achieve, and there are ways to do that. You guys have probably read about that in your textbook already. But a lot of times you don't want that. You want to avoid that. Say you're shooting photos of product or you're, you're uh, processing photos that someone else has shot of a product or scientific imagery or all kinds of things where you need everything to be sharp in the frame. And there are ways to do that. So you can stitch those together basically. If I open up all these layers where I focus or the, the photographer focused on the front tiny little doll, took a shot. They focus on the second doll took a shot, they focused on the third, and so on, all the way through. So you end up with the four photos, and in every single one of them, part of the photo is blurry, but part of it is sharp. In Photoshop, you bring those in on layers, and you auto-align those, and you auto-blend those. Um, your book is going to go into exactly how to do that, but I just wanted to go over this as an example of computational imaging and give you the, um, the name that we use for that. So... You'll see it as a couple different things, depth of field blending or focus stacking. Um, it can be called sometimes, but it's very similar to another technique, which we I don't have a slide to show you right now, but most of you are pretty familiar with panoramic images. I'm sure the majority of you have phones that will let you take panoramic photos with your phone's camera. You just click and then swipe your phone across the scene or take a series of photos, depending on which operating system your phone uses. But the idea is the same. It's basically taking a whole lot of photos and then your phone is stitching them or merging them together. Photoshop can do it as well. And obviously, if you're going to be working with high-end cameras, high resolution, um, they don't stitch the photos themselves necessarily, or they may not give you the results that you want to have. You want to have more control. Um, Photoshop will let you do that. So you can do the same thing. Stack the layers, click auto align. Photoshop does a really good job of this if the photos are shot properly which uh, take one of the photo classes if you want to get into that a little bit more, shooting the photos properly. But uh, auto line will line up all those photos. And I've had great success stitching 40, 50, 60 photo panoramic stitches. Um, it, it'll, it'll tax your computer quite a bit. It's a lot for your system to handle, but it'll do it. Auto blend will then look at the areas of overlap and it's going to apply a layer mask to every single image and blend those to get even tones and textures. And it's remarkable how good it is. If you don't have access to a camera where you can shoot this kind of stuff, you can go online and find some sample batches of photos. Or if you're really interested, post in the Facebook group and ask. And um, somebody else might have a camera or you can ask and I'll give you the photos. But anyways, uh, give that a try, doing some of that panoramic stitching. Here's an example of a photo series, a, a set of photos that were stitched actually. So you see the top left image is pretty badly distorted. 
The reason for that is because that was 45 photos, I believe, that were shot with a kind of a telephoto lens from a very, um, well, from one location. Most of you who are watching this are probably online students, but this is on the Polytechnic campus in one of the buildings. And it's this kind of uh, atrium or lobby. And because of how close everything is, how wide of a shot that is, I'm getting, you know, a, about a 180 degree view right there. It may not look like it in the photo, but that's a pretty wide view. There's a whole lot of images overlaid and stacked together there. And that introduces a ton of distortion to the image from perspective and getting it to stitch together. There's a lot of distortion. On the right side, what you see is something called the adaptive wide angle filter. On the adaptive wide angle filter, I left the guidelines on there. You can see there's tiny little cyan and magenta lines overlaying the image. So when you bring that image into Photoshop, Photoshop is, uh, to a certain extent, in certain parts of Photoshop, I should say, are what we call lens aware. They're aware of what lens was used and what camera was used based on the metadata that is embedded in the original file that came out of that camera. So when I took these pictures, and don't judge me too harshly, this was done really quickly as a demo <laughs> for the class. Uh, it's not the greatest stitch or the greatest photos, but anyways, um, Photoshop knows what lens was used and what camera was used and what focal length was used, meaning how zoomed in it was, and was able to use that information to create a very accurate stitch. And then once the stitch is done, it uses that information in the adaptive wide angle filter to straighten it out. Now, when you just click on the filter, it doesn't straighten it out completely. Those lines that I mentioned are called constraints. So by holding down the shift key, when I'm drawing a line vertically, you guys got to try this out sometime, but I draw one of those magenta lines and the lines on the left. Imagine you're looking at the photo on the left. It's all distorted. If I follow along on one of those lines that should be vertical, I just hold down shift. And when I click and let go, it straightens that line out. Everything else gets a little wonky too, because everything else gets rotated. But I go through and I put one of those lines, one of those constraints on every single line that should be straight in that building. And pretty soon the whole thing is all straightened out and I've removed a whole ton of distortion. So anyways, that's kind of how that works. There are some other lens aware tools in Photoshop, like the lens correction filter which is similar to adaptive wide angle, but you have less uh, direct control over what's going on with it. That's better, less, less so for panoramic stitches where you get really insane distortion and more for just correcting straightforward distortion that comes from using a wide angle lens or a lens uh, that has a lot of distortion for whatever reason. So uh, vanishing point is a cool tool for you as well. It helps in compositing sometimes when you want to add a vanishing point to a scene. So let's say you're putting some text into a scene on a wall or on a street or something like that. And you want it to look like it fits in with the perspective of the scene. The vanishing point can be used for that kind of thing too. All right, that's all we have for this lecture. For le lecture uh, 3A and 3B we just covered. So check back in on lecture 4 and we'll move on from there.